Good morning, students. Let's jump right in with our very first model. What I'd ask you to like what I'd like to ask you to do is to come on in, take a seat, and let's follow the rules. The first rule, let's position yourself in a circle with your classmates so that there's one classmate immediately to your left and another immediately to your right. And then you can choose to either start the simulation sitting down or standing up. All right, good. Looks like all of you have chosen to sit down. Let's go on and look at the next rule. Each time the instructor claps, I'm making noise with my hands, you're going to do one of the following. Either if you are seated, which all of you are now, then you're going to look to your right. You're going to turn and look over your right shoulder to the person who is sitting on your right. If and this IFF stands for if and only if, it's a computer term for if and only if, the person on your right is standing up, then you're going to count to five silently in your head. One, two, three, four, five. And then you're going to stand up. On the other hand, if you are standing, you're going to count to five, and then you're going to sit down. Right now, since we've all chosen to be a certain way before our simulation even starts, we have all adopted what we will call initial conditions. Initial conditions are basically the situation, the conditions that we are all, are all in before the simulation begins. And I see here that you've all chosen to start by sitting down. So our initial conditions right now are that all of our participants here are starting by being seated. Let's see what happens when we actually execute the rules in our model. All right, is everybody ready? I'm about to make a clapping sound. Everybody apply the rules. Here we go, three, two, one. Okay, I don't think much has happened. Let's try that again. Three, two, one. Hmm, what's happening here? Three, two, one. Notice these initial conditions don't seem to lead to very much interesting behavior. What's happening here? Well, everybody's sitting down. Is everybody applying the rules? Well, if you remember what the rules are, right now everyone is seated. So everyone is seated, looking to their right, and I'm guessing that none of you see anybody standing up. So you don't have to do anything. You were just, well, staying seated. How about we try a different initial condition? Everybody stand up. Let's see what happens there. Come on, come on, stand up. Yep, up, you two over there on the right, stand up. All right, everybody's standing now, good. Oh wait, nope, there's one more of you. All right, now we're all standing up. Everybody ready to apply the rules? Again, think about what your rule is going to be. I'm going to clap my hands, and everybody's going to need to apply that rule. Are we ready? One, two, three. Okay, good. Looks like something happened. Let's try it again. Let's apply the rule. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. I think I'm beginning to see a little bit of a pattern here. Let's try this one more time. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, something different happened, but then we went back and everything's staying sort of the same again. What's going on? I know, let's try this. Let's try a different initial condition. Everybody sit down except for, yeah, you over there. How about we have one person start standing up and everybody else will sit down. Let's see if that changes things. All right, there we have it. One of you standing up now. Let's see if we can execute our rules. Everybody think about it. Remember, there's two rules. One set of rules for when you're standing up and one set of rules for when you're sitting down. Everybody ready to execute those rules? All right, let's see what happens. On the count of three. Ready, one, two, three. Ready, one, two, three. Ready, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, 
One, two, three. Anybody seeing a pattern here? Think you can run the pattern without my synchronization? Maybe you can do it without me actually putting the clap in place? Let's see here. I'm not gonna clap. I'll clap once and then we can see if we can keep going. Go ahead. Let's do it. And hey, there we go. Anybody recognize this pattern? Ever seen this before? I bet you have. If you've ever been to a stadium, maybe a ball game here in Durham, North Carolina, we have the Durham Bulls, and this will happen at least once, if not a couple times during a game, where you look to your right and you see somebody, and if they stand up and go, woo, and then they sit back down, what do you do? You stand up and go, woo, and then you sit back down. And this creates a phenomenon that we use in crowds known as the wave. And why is it called the wave? Well, if you think about it, it looks a lot like what happens at the ocean when the water rises up and then it falls back down again. And it rises up and it falls back down again. And when does it do that? Well, it does that when the water next to it rises up and falls down. So we've created our first model and this model using very simple rules gives us an overall behavior that looks a little bit like something we call a wave. What happens if we start with instead of just one person standing up, we have two people standing up, maybe on opposite sides. Let's try that. Two people standing up. Can you think about what you think is going to happen here? All right, let's check it out. Seems like we get the wave, but the wave is occurring in two different places. And because we're sitting in a circle, the wave continues to go around and around. Actually, both waves, now that there are two of them, continues to go around and around that circle. But let me ask you about another set of initial conditions. What if we get more complex? Let's try something a little bit different. All right, here we go. I see that every, well, we'll say all the odd people are standing up and all the even people are sitting down. Let's go ahead and execute our process again here. Everybody follow the rules on the sound of the clap. Ready? One, two, three, go. Let's do it again. One, two, three, go. This behavior is looking a little bit different. One, two, three, go. All right, let's see what happens if I just let you kind of run the process. Ah, interesting. If I step back and look at this, I can kind of see the waves moving around in a circle. But if I look more closely at any individual one of you, there seems to be this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That behaves a little bit different than what we've seen before. Let's try one more set of initial conditions. Everybody gets to choose whether they're standing up or sitting down. Let's pick that randomly and see what happens. Well, that sort of went as expected. About half of you are standing up. In fact, exactly half of you are standing up, six of you, and half of you are sitting down, six of you. And uh, well, now we have some groups. We sort of have three of you that are standing up in a group next to each other, and two of you that are standing up in a group next to each other, and another one of you that's sort of standing up by yourself. So before we start here, think. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think this is going to look like? All right, we right now we have an idea about what we think it's going to look like. Let's go ahead and apply the rules. 
Remember, there's six of you standing up right now. Let's see what happens. Hmm, it seems to be there are only three people standing up right now. What happened? Uh, let's try that again. Let's rethink that. Let's everybody try that again. I want to see, make sure everybody's applying the rules. Let's watch what happens in this first step. Everybody ready? Okay, so there were six people standing up, but now we see that there are only three people or only three waves that have managed to survive the rules and continue to go. So, if this is really representing a wave, do you think we're capturing all the information about the wave? So we started with a bunch of different initial conditions, but we always applied the same rules. And even though we applied the same rules, with the different initial conditions, we got sort of different kinds of behavior. Let's talk about the kind of behavior we saw. What patterns did we see in our overall circle? Each individual had some rules, but the overall circle showed some patterns. What was that first pattern there? Well, when we were all sitting down, nothing happened. We just kind of remained sitting down. Why? Because when you looked around and saw no one standing, there was no reason to stand up, at least according to the rules. So this idea when you have a pattern that basically repeats itself where there is no change, even though there's potential in the rules for change, we call this a steady state. The state, the condition everybody is in, stays the same, it's steady. We have a steady state pattern. So when we start at the beginning, everybody's seated, we had a steady state pattern. However, when we started with everybody standing up, there was a little bit of motion that was in there where we sat down. And then after everybody was sitting down, we went back to a steady state pattern. When you're looking for patterns in science, we'll often look for situations where we reach the steady state. And the time when you're moving around before you get to steady state, that one step where everybody's standing up and then everybody sat down, that's what we call transient behavior. T-R-A-N-S-I-E-N-T, -E transient behavior. That space before you reach a consistent pattern, like a steady state pattern. What else did we see? Well, we also saw the wave. We saw this sort of motion that repeated itself over time, but where somebody stood up, and then they sat back down, and the person next to them stood up, and they sat back down, and the next person stood up, and that looked a little bit like the form of a wave moving around the circle. What else did we see? How else would we describe those other things? What happens when everybody was up and everybody was down? What happened when half of us were up and half of us were down? When we had that situation, instead of it looking like a wave, you could also look at it as a up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, sort of a flashing behavior or what we would call oscillatory behavior, an oscillation, something that changes between one state and goes back to another state. In this case, the entire pattern goes from all the, shall we say, the odd people standing up and then the even people standing up and then all the odd people standing up and all the even people standing up. So that's another kind of behavior, steady state, everything stays the same. We might have something like the wave where things are moving around, we can see them. We could have oscillations where things move up and then they return to a state and then they return to the state again. So we're beginning to see some overall patterns or overall behavior from this simple set of rules. So let's talk about the parts, what we, the pieces that were necessary to create this model. First of all, there were the individual agents, in this case, you students. You were each sort of individuals. The individual agents could be something, some individual person that's acting, some particle that's acting, maybe a rock, maybe something that represents a molecule, maybe some kind of animal. Or perhaps it might even be a place, a sort of place in space that's interacting. But the key idea is there's something that has some rules for interacting with the other somethings. And these somethings we're going to call agents for our agent model. Each of our agents in this model has some states. In this case, two, binary being the word for two. Okay, so this is a, there are binary states. The two states here were standing 
or sitting. We didn't distinguish between things like scratching my head or wearing a certain color clothing. And even though some of you might have looked a little different, those weren't important for our model. The only two important parts for our model was, were whether you were standing up or whether you were sitting down. Okay, We started with some initial states. You either had to be standing up or sitting down at the beginning of the model. Okay, um, Here's another thing that we talked about, our boundaries. Notice with this model, we all sat in a circle. So everybody had somebody to the right and everybody had somebody to the left looking at them. And because we connected that circle, it made it pretty easy. However, what would have happened if I had you all sit in a straight line? Well, if you were all in a straight line, then the person who was sitting on the far left would have nobody looking at them, nobody following them for their rules. And the person sitting at the far right would have to need some special rules. What do they do? They have nobody on their right to look at. So how would they behave? And we would have to give them some special set of rules for how they would behave. Would they always stand up? Would they always sit down? Would they make something up? Those would create our boundary conditions, which are gonna be very important for the behavior of our model. One of the things about our rules, our rules basically governed how we behaved based on the states or the conditions that our neighbors were in. We looked to the person to our right. We could have looked to the person on our left, but in this case, we didn't care so much about them. All we cared about is the one neighbor on our right and a little bit about ourselves. If we were sitting down, we did something different than if we were standing up. So the rules were subject to the states of ourselves, the agents we were, and of our neighbors, the agents that were close to us. And then what did we do? We applied the rules. Clap. We applied the rules again. Clap. We applied the rules again. Clap. The term for repeatedly applying these rules, and notice synchronize. Synchronize meant that we all did it at the same time. The reason why I wanted to have you count to five before you applied the rules is because if you looked at the person at their right and they were faster than you and making their decision and they had already sat down or already stood up, then that would change what choice you would make. So in order to synchronize this all together, I had you make your decisions and then I gave you sort of five seconds of time to stay in the same state before you changed so that there wasn't sort of a confusion about which state you were in while your neighbor was making their choice and applying their rules. That synchronization is particularly important if you're gonna build an effective model. And the term we're using for this is an iteration. An iteration is one application of the rules where all the agents apply the rules. And then once we're done with that, we can repeat that process. I clap my hands again, everybody applies the rules again, and that would be an iteration. Now it turns out our first little model here is an example of something that's called a cellular automata. Cellular, well, comes from the same sort of idea as a biological cell. Our agents could be considered cells if it's sort of a, described as a place in space. And automata are something that automatically repeats our process, that automatically iterates. So our little model here, and or the wave that we all learned when we were, or we may have seen before when we were at a ball game, okay, are uh, recorded There's some information about them written by Stephen Wolfram in a big thick book called A New Kind of Science, which we'll be referring to quite a bit um, as we talk about models, okay? In his model, he describes sort of a generic, a more general version of this system that creates the wave. So we're going to recreate his model, okay? And we're going to start with defining our agents. In this case, our agents are going to be individual grid boxes in a row, each with two neighbors. Hmm. You're going to need some graph paper. Go ahead and find yourself a piece of graph paper. And when you do, let's continue. So for this model, I'm going to ask you to identify the first row, the first row of grid boxes across the top of your piece of graph paper. You don't necessarily have to box them out. I'm just drawing them here. Okay. And our agents in this particular case, our agents are going to be each of these individual grid boxes. For example, this grid box here in red would be an individual agent 
in my new system. Note that each of my agents has two neighbors, and a neighbor that's immediately to the right, and a neighbor that's immediately to the left. Actually, maybe I should draw it like this, immediately to the right, and immediately to the left. Each of our agents is going to have one of two states. This is going to be a binary system. So the two states could either be on or off. We could think about something as being on or something being off. We could think about it as a computer does, where it's a one or a zero. Or we could think about it with a color situation, where we fill one in as black and the other one as white. Now we're going to have to decide which one is going to be sort of the on or the off, or the black or the white in this particular case. Let's go ahead with the black color being off as if we turn something off, the lights off, and the white color being on. Once we've established these states, we will want a set of initial conditions. An initial row of however many cells there are. In this case it says 50 cells, but you might have a different number of cells across the, your row of paper. Okay, But we'll have to decide whether or not we're going to start with some with what our initial states are, whether we're going to be on or off and then we'll want to work with us the patterns from there. Well, let's go ahead and create some initial conditions in our first row of, uh, in our first row of grid boxes. Now, one of the things you might come to realize here is that even though we have this idea of there being two states, a state that's on, um, in which case we're indicating by a white box, and a state that's off that we're indicating by a black box, the problem with that is that how do we indicate a box that we haven't decided on yet because it's on or it's empty. So actually what we're going to do here is we're going to indicate on the condition of being on. Well, let's start with the condition of being off. If the condition is being off, we're going to fill in the box with a dark color so it's been turned off. Okay, maybe I'll turn this one off. But if I want to indicate the condition of one being on, I have to somehow indicate that I've decided that that one's on. So I'm going to do that by maybe putting sort of a little, sketching a little round circle in there. That indicates that it's on and that I've decided that it's on, okay, but that it's not unlike the ones to the right here that I haven't decided on yet. I'll have, I'll know that, that, that I've actually dealt with that one. So we're kind of dealing with three states. The state of being on, the state of being off, and the state of I haven't decided yet because it's just a blank piece of paper. Let's go ahead and finish creating a series here. And I'm going to ask you to actually at least for the first few of these, to create them so it looks a little bit like mine as it'll make it easier for the next part of the demonstration. So let's go ahead and fill in just a few more of these boxes with some somewhat random initial conditions. And now I have it done nowhere near 50. In fact, I've done about 5, 10, 15, maybe 16 or so. But we're going to stop there because that should be good enough for our purposes right now. As was our case for our initial model, where we were all standing and sitting, there are lots of possibilities for initial conditions for this model. We could all start with them all on. We could start with them all off. We could start with a single cell on or a single cell off and all the others the other way. We could start with some sort of pattern, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, as we tried. Or we could start with some sort of random distribution, which is what we've just created. Okay. The next thing we have to discuss is the boundary conditions. How do you handle the ends of the, of the line, of the row? In this case, we're going to make our boundary conditions just like the boundary conditions, conditions we had when we were sitting in a circle. The boxes at the left and right ends are considered to be neighbors, as if the row was arranged in a circle. Let's look at that. what that means on our graph paper. So what that means is that this box over here on the far left, which doesn't have a neighbor to its left, we're going to consider it being connected to the box over here on the far right, which doesn't have a neighbor on its right. So the two of them are going to be, end up being neighbors to each other. We're going to make these connected boundary conditions. 
Now the thing about connected boundary conditions is they make it really easy for the model to behave and so that it's the same everywhere, that every single thing has a neighbor. However, there's a problem with that kind of modeling in the sense that those kind of boundary conditions don't exist as frequently in real physical systems. Yes, there are some physical systems. If we're modeling the entire Earth, if you go to the right side of the Earth and keep going and keep going and keep going, eventually you come all the way back around again. So that works for systems that are circular. But very often we're not looking at systems that are full, fully global at a global scale and might go from one side of a continent to another side of a continent or from one side of a city to another side of a city if we're thinking about places in space. So in this case, we're going to do it for, to simplify our model, but there are going to be other times where we're going to want to make boundary conditions that um, are a little bit more complex and we'll have to work with the rules to determine what we do in the boundary. And they are very important to how our models behave. For this model, an iteration is going to be another row. Each successive row is laid out below the previous iteration, maintaining a record of the states in the vertical space. So before, where we had one state, then I clap my hands and everything changed, and then I clap my hands and everything changed, we were keeping track of iterations in time. But unless you took pictures at every single t time step, we wouldn't necessarily know what had happened in the past. In this case, we're going to organize our iterations in space that the first row is going to be, well, our initial conditions, but the second row will record our application of rules. So each of the little grid boxes will be represented by a column that the grid box in the very middle and all the ones below it will represent that same grid at just different steps in the process. For example, this grid that I'm going to mark in purple here, if we look at that grid, if we look at the boxes that are below it, each of these successive boxes below it will represent the state of that grid after each application of rules. So the first one is the state of that grid upon the initial conditions. The second one is after one of application of rules, after the second application, after the third application, after the fourth application. So first application, second, third, fourth, and then usually we represent the initial conditions with a zero. Okay, sort of the initial state corresponds with time zero or zero steps having been executed. So each of our successive rows is going to be one application of our rules or one iteration. So what are the rules? Here they are, rules. The state of a new box is determined from the current box and its two nearest neighbors. So I'm going to look at what state I am. Am I on or off? I'm going to look to my right. I'm going to look to my left. Okay, And that will help determine what my new state will be. Let's see here. 8 to 2 to the 3rd possible combinations. Each determines one of the two states. So let's talk about what this means. So if I'm a box, so let's consider the condition of our little box one here, our purple box number one. We notice purple box number one is a later version of the box that's right above it, box zero, which we notice is on at the beginning of this, uh, is on as an initial condition. And then there's also a box to the upper left and to the right, basically the boxes to the left and right of box zero, one of which is on and the other which is off. Let's go ahead and replicate that on the next page so we can talk about what's happening. So here's box number one, and here's box number zero that's on, and the box to the left of it, which is also on, and the box to the right of it, which is off. Okay, and we want to figure out what box number one is going to be, and it needs to look at each of those three boxes. Now, there are many possible combinations, well, by many I mean eight possible combinations of things that could come from these boxes. There are two possibilities for the box on the left. Two possibilities for the box on the left. There's two possibilities for the box in the middle. And there's two possibilities for the box on the right. Two times two times two is equal to eight. Two to the third 
for eight possible combinations of boxes that we could have to determine our state. Let's see if we can figure out what all those possible combinations are. Take a moment and see if you can think about what each of them is. So what combinations did you get? Let's see here. It's possible that all of them could be off, 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 off. That would look something like this, where they were all filled in, all filled in, and all filled in. Okay, that's one possible combination of boxes. Another one might be off, off, and then on, where the two boxes on the left are off, but the one on the right is on. What else here? Off, on, off. In this case, our box in the middle is on, and the ones on the right and left are off. Or we can have off, on, and on. Turn the one on the left off, and the other two are on. Well, that's four of our eight. And notice, in all four of those, the left-hand box was off, now I'm going to do a similar set of patterns, but this case where four conditions where the leftmost box is on. So we have on, off, off, on, off, off. We have on, off, on. So only the middle one is off. We have on, on, off. On, on, and off. And finally, we have on, on, and on, where all three of them are on. Well, before, when we had our simple version of the wave, all we cared about was our condition of ourselves, whether we were standing or sitting down, and the person to our right. In fact, when we were sitting down, we didn't really, uh, when we were standing up, we didn't even care about the person to our right. When we were standing up, we immediately sat back down again. However, when we were sitting down, we looked to the right and saw whether they were standing up, and that meant that we stood up. So there was just a couple of things to look at. Well, for each of these, we now have eight different possible things that we could see when we observe ourselves and our neighbors. And for each of those things, we can create or make up a rule that determines what we're going to do next. So let's create some rules for each of these states. Um, I'm going to start with one here. We're going to say that when we start with all three of them off, let's leave it off. And then let's say when we have this second situation here, off, off, on, let's turn it on. How about we'll make this one on, we'll make this one off. Notice I'm choosing these somewhat arbitrarily here. Okay, as just an example, what we're doing is figuring out all the possible combinations and what we will do when we see those combinations. Let's make this last one on. I made a lot of them off here. And we'll make that last one go off. Now, there isn't a particular logic to this choice here. What I've simply done is come up with a possible way of, well, a set of rules. There are eight rules here. When I see state number one here, where everything's off, then I'm going to stay off myself. If I see state number two, well, then I'm going to make a different choice. If I see state number three, so on and so forth, I'm going to make a different choice. Let's go back and see what this means. Well, let's actually look for what this means for our condition for box number one here. If you look, we have off, I mean, I'm sorry, on, on, and off. Well, where is that? On on and off. Well, we've decided to make that one a condition where we're going to remain on. If we see that condition, we're going to remain on. So, let me go to my graph paper. And for that grid right there, we've determined that based on this on, on, and off, we're going to remain on. Okay? Well, let's look at the grid that's immediately to the right of that. This one right here. All right, from there I see on, off, and off. Well, according to my set of rules, what does on, off, 
off tell me to do? Let's see here. On, off, off. That tells me to turn off. So I'm going to apply for this one. I'm going to apply the rules based on the three things that were above me. Let me do that for the one that's next to it. Now this one has three that are above it. All three of them are off. And if I go and look at my rules for everything off, it says stay off. All right, let's repeat that process for just a few more of these steps. I'll do it slowly here that you can watch. You should be able to figure it out by yourself. And do, well, let's fill out some of this in both directions. All right, now I've encountered a difficulty or a difference here. Now I've reached the far right side, but hopefully you already know what to, how to handle that far right side. In this particular case, I need a rule of three things. I'm gonna use the green color here to sort of help me out. So I'm trying to figure out what's happening in this spot right here. Well, to do that, I need to know the one that's directly above me and the one that's to the left and the one that's to the right. <coughs> but which one is to the right? Well, according to our boundary conditions, the one to the right is the one that's way over here on the far left because they're connected to each other. So now, to figure out my state for this one here on the right in green, I look at the ones above it. It looks like it's off, off, and then the one way over here is also off. So all three of those are off, and I know that off, off, off also gives me off. Notice using a different color is another way to sort of keep track of things here. Okay, um, so similarly, if I go all the way over here to the left side, what does it have for neighbors? Well, it has the one that's on the far right, which is off. Let's do this in blue. Okay, this one is off. The one that's in the middle right above it is off. And the one to the right of that is off. So all three of those are off. So this one at the far left is also going to be off. And if I keep going here, I should be able to complete the rest of this. I know that off, off, on gives me on. I know that the alternating one gives me on. And then this is off. And finally, off, on, on gives me off. So now, after completing all of these pieces, I have now created 
a row that represents my first iteration. We have a new set of states. Some of them are off, some of them are on, and that is our first iteration. Check and see if yours matches mine. Maybe you can see some mistakes, I hope not. But maybe you can find, uh, hopefully you can understand how the process works. So now Stephen Wolfram, in studying this system, realized that this one group of eight different ways to interpret it could be considered a set of rules, or actually that's what he called the rules for one of his possibilities. And he said, well, there's lots and lots and lots of combinations of these. In fact, there are 256, or 2 to the 8th, possible combinations of these rules. How did he get that? Well, he recognized for each combination of boxes, there was one choice for whether you turn it on or turn it off. For example, with off, off, and off, you could have either turned it on or off. So there were two choices for that one, two choices for the next one, two choices for each of these. And if you multiply two eight times, you get two to the eighth power, which is equal to 256. So there are 256 possible combinations of these interpretations here. And that's what he would call a rule. So he said there were 256 types of rules that corresponded with just this one simple little model. Wolfram also said, well, there's got to be a way of keeping track of these rules to sort of, so we can sort of talk about the same rules and understand what they are. For example, one of these rules is the wave that you were talking about. Well, how do we know we could name all of them? But that's 256 different names. And he wanted to keep track of these in a slightly different way. So he decided to use a numbering system for keeping track of these. And this numbering system takes into account the whole idea of binary counting. The idea, the same idea as um, what is used for computers when computers do their thinking, a binary counting system. Some of you may be familiar with this. If not, this might be the first time you're going to see it. So for example, what Rolfram said is he decided to put things in the same order that we've put them here, where the first kind of switch was off, off, off. The second one was off, off, on. The third one was off, on, off, and so on and so forth. And what he did for each of those, he said, okay, for each of those I'm going to assign a zero or a one. And the whole combination of all those zeros and ones will make an eight digit number, but an eight digit number that only has zeros and ones. For example, he took this first one right here and he said this is a zero because it was off. You see how I have it off over here? And he took this second one here, and he made that the next digit, and he said that that's a one. And then he take this third one here, and that was also a one. This one that's right here is a zero. The one that's next to it is a zero. This one is a zero. This one is a one. And this one is a zero. So the binary code number, this is in binary, it's all in zeros and ones, for this particular rule is 010000110. Zero, 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 one, one, zero. However, we're human beings. We tend to do stuff in groups of tens in the decimal system, which is what you learn when you're in kindergarten and first grade and you're first learning how to count. And why? Well, because we have 10 fingers and that makes it easier to sort of group things in chunks of 10. Well, there is a way to translate this big long binary number 01000110 into decimals. In your decimal system, you'll remember that first you can count up from 0 to 9. But if you had a number that was something like 328, you'll notice that the first digit is your ones digit, that you have eight ones. And your second digit is your tens digit. You have two tens, which is 20. 
and your third digit is your hundreds digit. And you have three hundred, so three hundred twenty eight. Notice the ones, the tens, and the hundreds, these are all in base 10, that your first digit was 10 to the zeroth power, your second digit was 10 to the first power, and your third digit was 10 to the second power. And notice your fourth digit would be 10 to the third power, or thousands, and so on and so forth, that each of your digits in this system goes up by a factor of 10. Well, in our binary system, each digit in the binary system goes up by a factor of 2. Our first digit in the binary system, let's create some space here to write it, our first digit in the binary system is just like in the decimal system. That's our ones place. So in here, that's the number of ones we have. However, instead of going up by a factor of 10, in our binary system we're going to go up by a factor of 2. The second digit is our twos place. So in this case, I have zero ones, but I have one two. The third digit is two to the second power, or our fours place. Then our eights place, our sixteenths place, our thirty seconds place. Some of you might recall two and two are four, four and four are eight. It's a song about an inchworm. Eight and eight are sixteen, sixteen and sixteen are thirty-two basically is a song about a little lynchworm measuring things. Well, after 32, 32 times 2 is 64, and 64 times 2 is, is 128. Okay, well, let's see here. So if that's how many pieces there are, each of those represents how many groups of each thing you have. In the first case, for our number here, if we want to convert it into decimals, we do it this way. We have zero ones. That's zero. We have one, two, so that's plus two. We have one, four, so that's plus four. We don't have any eights or sixteens or thirty seconds, but we do have a sixty-four, and we don't have any a hundred and twenty eights. Okay? So what I've done is I've coded, I've taken my offs and ons and offs and ons and offs and ons, and I've taken all the ons and made them into ones, and all the offs and made them into zeros, there's my ones and zeros, but once I put them all in this order like this, I can convert that into a decimal value by keeping track, by giving them each an amount that's a binary amount. In this case, I have a 64, I have a four and a two, when I add 64 plus four plus two, that gives me plus 4 plus 2, that's going to give me 68, a total value of 70. And according to Wolfram's convention, this rule that we've used right here is rule 70. So here's my challenge for you. Which rule is the rule that we've already seen? Which rule is the wave? Pause the lesson and see if you can figure it out before I give you the answer. So let's think about the, what the rules of the wave said. First of all, the rules of the wave said, if you were sitting down, then you look to the person on your right. But if you were standing up, well, then you sat back down. Let's start with the ideas of if you were standing up. We're going to consider standing up to be on. So again, up is on. Well, which of these are we, the person who's in the middle, we're looking at our neighbors, in which case are the ones that we're standing up? Well, in these four cases are all the cases where we were standing up. And the rule for that, when we were standing up, was to sit down. So in all the cases where we started standing up, we now turn ourselves off or sit down. That there came the case where we were sitting down, but we looked to our right and we saw somebody standing up. Here I am sitting down and I look to my right and there's somebody standing up. There's another case where I'm sitting down. Here it is where I'm sitting down and I look to my right and I see somebody standing up. Well, what do I do in that case? 
In those cases, we were told to stand up. Okay. Finally, what was the last condition? Well, these other conditions, I'm sitting down, but I look to my right and somebody's already down. Well, it didn't say to do anything there. So if I'm not doing anything, I guess I'm just staying in the same seated position or the same off position. So now, according to Wolfram's rules here, and again, we gotta make sure these are in the same order as Wolfram has them in, which this is how, this is the order, the off, 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 on. If you want to record that order, it might be a good idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and look and give these a number. This is zero. Again, but this number here is the one on the far left, and then we'll keep going. This is the one, then zero, zero, and then zero, one, zero, zero. There's the one, there's the zero. Okay, there's all our eight digits. And so our Wolfram code is zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero. But that's kind of confusing and we're not used to that. So let's convert that into decimal. How do we convert that into decimal? Well, we recognize the places. Here's my ones place. Here's my twos place, four, eight, 16, 32. I really only care about the places where I have a value of one. I have one, two, and one, 32. 32 plus 2 is equal to 34. So rule 34 is the wave, or at least the wave as we created it. Rule 34, the wave. So let's go back and look at that sort of original model we were working with. Here we have my first row, my initial conditions and I calculated the second row for that sort of first iteration. Do you see any patterns here? Well, it's kind of messy. It's all sorts of different colors. Maybe it would work better if I colored them all in black, but it's gonna be kind of hard to see those at least until I do a bunch of different rows to see if there is any sort of relationship. I mean, we could watch when people are standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down in patterns, but now there should be some patterns we might be able to see in space, but it's gonna be kind of hard to see those patterns here until we've done a lot of work. And this is one of the ideas behind computer modeling. Well, we have, we've done this process, but why don't we ask the computer to do the process for us? If the computer can do the process for us and show us what this looks like, maybe we can work with the computer to see the overall patterns in the system. One place you can explore these patterns is in the book A New Kind of Science by Stephen Wolfram. But another place we can do it is through um, a program that will be provided to you in NetLogo. Here's a called WolframShellCA.nLogo. It's a little hard to read there. WolframShellCA.nLogo. Let's go take a look at that program. When you open up the Wolfram Shell CA file in NetLogo, you should see something like this. You should see a few buttons on the side that say set up, draw, reset, and go. And you should see a blank screen with ticks equal zero on the top. In order to run this, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to click on the button that says set up. Nothing will really happen with set up except that you'll see a thin white line across the top. Okay. In that case, that thin white line is going to represent sort of our off conditions. Black will represent our haven't decided yet. And then we're going to use red to represent the on conditions in this case. It's a little bit different. The red is going to be on and the black and the white is going to be off. In order for me to create the initial conditions, I'm going to click on draw. What that'll do is it'll highlight the draw and then I can click on individual pixels. If I hold on the pixels, they'll go off and on, but I can click on them. And if it's a red pixel, I can turn it off. If it's a white pixel, I can turn it on by clicking. And so you can create a set of initial conditions along that top row. If you would like, you could potentially recreate the initial conditions from our um, the initial conditions from our example from before if you wanted to check. But I'm going to create sort of a, a, a set of somewhat random initial conditions. Once I'm done drawing those initial conditions, I can click off to turn off the draw which means I will not confuse it by changing things in the middle of the process. 
Okay. So now let's put in one of our rules. Let's go first with that rule number 70. Rule number 70. Okay, from our example before, if I remember correctly. So there's a little slider here that allows you to slide, and oh, it goes all the way up to 255, from 0 to 255, representing all those possible rules that Wolfram talked about, where 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 255 is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Notice if you add up all the different possibilities, if you add up 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, 32, 64, 128, the number you get is 255. So let's go ahead and slide this slider until it hits rule 70. We're going to leave on the horizontal wrap. That's the whether or not our boundary condition is attached on the right and the left. Okay. Um, and you'll notice when we put in rule 70, it says generic variable mapping, here's rule 70, and it gives us the numbers for rule 70. Notice these are kind of in reverse order. It actually has the off, off, off down at the bottom and the on, on, on up at the top. That's kind of the flipped over from how we wrote it before. But it gives us our binary representation of rule 70. Now I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go ahead and hit go. And when I hit go, what I should see is a repeated application of the rules and in this case these is a repeated application of the rules for rule 70. Okay and notice we see some sort of patterns that exist in here. Okay you'll see these sort of long stripes that are sort of developed. You'll see some little dots. Well look what happened. It looks like we're getting what we would call oscillations. We go from on to off to on, I mean, sorry, yeah, on to off to on to off to on to off to on to off, making this kind of little checkerboard almost pattern, okay? You'll also see that there is some of what we will call transient behavior, where we get into a pattern later on, but early on in the pattern, we actually see that there are some changes Okay, let's go ahead and put in what was the rule number that we just got for our wave? What was the rule number we just got for wave? If I remember, that was rule 34. So to do rule 34, I'm going to have to slide to hit rule 34. Oops. And then I'm going to hit reset, I believe. And when you hit reset, what that will do is it will keep the same initial conditions but it'll apply rule 34. And now when I hit go, now, how does this represent the wave? Well, if you think about it, if you remember what we saw when we had groups of people standing up and sitting down, whenever there was a row of people, that row disappeared in that first row, but then everything moved a little bit to one side. Okay, in this case, if the person's looking to one side, looking to the right. Well, let's see, is this sliding? Does this make sense to me? Well, what it's saying is that the little front of what you're doing is moving in one direction. Okay, this might be a little counterintuitive because it looks like it might be sliding in the opposite direction to what we were thinking about. Okay, but the idea here is that, that in space, or in time, we saw this little thing that would move up and then it would move around. Well, that's what's happening here, is that as we go further down, any place that of something that was standing up, the person who was next to them is now standing up, and that creates this sort of diagonal line. So, what kind of patterns might we see next? Can we find steady state patterns? What would a steady state pattern look like? Well, if we think about it, if each line looks exactly the same as the line before it, that would be what we would consider steady state. What would cyclical pattern or an oscillatory pattern be? In other words, what would happen if we went from one state to another state and back and forth again? Perhaps that's the term we should have used earlier, a cyclical pattern. Growing patterns, symmetric patterns, localized structure, self-similarity, moving local structure. What are all these patterns we're looking for? I have no idea.
So what's next? Explore. Hopefully you have an understanding about how these patterns are getting generated, but there are 256 rules, and some of them have some very interesting patterns that come out of them. So poke around, explore, look a little bit, and pretty soon you'll have an assignment that allows you to explore this with just a little more purpose.